Choices, written by Jennifer Howard, narrated by Chad Jones. For more information on Jennifer Howard, visit jennifer-howard.net. For more information on Chad Jones, visit cjvopro.com. At the end of the gravel driveway that both time and mankind had long ignored, there lay the remains of a mailbox. Random teenaged angst had caused the now dented box and splinters of its rotten wood to stand to rest uneasily amidst patches of weeds and ruts. Paint cracked and peeled in strips along its side. The name inked there had faded away long ago. But I remembered it. Jones. The name had read Jones. Once, a small white house had stood just past the curve in the drive. To a child's eyes, such as mine, it was pleasant enough. The grass was always short and neat, and smoke sometimes curled from its chimney on cold mornings. No detail was striking enough to draw the average person's glance towards the house, though. Cars constantly flew past its frontage. The individuals driving these raced along the country lane toward work or school or other such demands of life with nary a viewing of the property. And so it remained for many years. Until that day. It was the morning of my sister's 16th birthday, and a Saturday at that. Mother insisted that we make an early trip to town to pick up the cake from the bakers, as there was much to prepare for the day's upcoming festivities. I accompanied her in annoyed silence, trusting that my frosty attitude would amply communicate my displeasure at being ripped away from my idolized weekend cartoons. As we pulled round the bend, the sky was dark with smoke. It was not the smoke of a typical, cheerful fireplace but that of a raging inferno recently spent. The blackened, yawning mouth of the house's doorway, along with the burst glass and jagged-edged windows that flanked it, reminded me of a face screaming in horror. Smoke continued to belch forth from a hole in the roof. Police lights flashed as Mrs. Jones, the lady of the house, stood at the end of the driveway. Another neighbor... Clad in a faded dress and apron just like hers, threw arms of comfort around her shoulders. As our car passed the scene, my gaze, blue and bright and childlike, locked briefly with hers, dark and secretive and deadened. It was as if time froze in that moment. The only two forces that existed were her lifeless eyes doing battle with mine, attempting to drain them of every last drop of their innocence. Just when I thought she had won, a policeman and an honest navy waved mother forward and broke the line of sight that connected Mrs. Jones to me. I gulped deeply for air. I hadn't even realized, before then, that I had been holding my breath. The day after the incident, the local Sunday newspaper reported that the blaze had been more than likely due to an unattended cigarette. Weeks later, as one body surfaced in the rubble of the newly discovered basement, and then another, and yet another, our town was thrown into a frenzy. Apparently, Mr. Jones had a penchant for young girls. He ran off three months previously with an 18-year-old that had tickled his fancy. Mrs. Jones had given him 20 years, yet he had given her nothing in return except for a drained checking account and a notice that the bank was ready to foreclose on the house. After this, Mrs. Jones found a few young girls of her own. She liked to bind them, and gag them, and burn them, over and over again. Eventually, gagging them proved to be insufficient. They simply wouldn't shut up. She needed to slit their throats to silence the voices that constantly shouted in her head. Their voices. His voice. She did so with the knife that she had always used to slice his freshly baked bread. That made her chuckle, or so she told the police. Ironically, Mrs. Jones tortured those poor girls with the same cigarettes that caused such violent destruction to her house of horror. Had the accident not occurred, who knows how much longer her madness would have ensued, unchecked, 
No one had a clue about any of it. The townspeople were shocked and mortified. But I wasn't surprised. Every secret, every shame, every fear, every crazed, hopeless day of her existence, I saw them all in her dead eyes that day as our eyes met. Every single one. As long as I live, I will never forget the feeling of unease that crept its way across the back of my neck and down my spine at the sight of Mrs. Jones that day. For years afterward, I dreamt of the house, with its windows alight with hell's fire. Smoke, coupled with evil laughter, would pour from the doorway. Mrs. Jones would then appear in that dream doorway, wearing the very same etherized expression as she did on that day. This time, though, her face would be melting away, dripping like candle wax. Only her lifeless gaze remained intact. Its tenacity reached for my very soul until, subconsciously, I forced myself out of that dream state. I would awake screaming and in a sweat-filled panic after every such dream. The same feeling of emptiness as from that day always blanketed my heart upon waking. Mother continually dismissed my nightmares as the mental ramblings of a child with an overactive imagination. But I knew otherwise. I grew older, made my choices, as all young men do, and moved across the country. The nightmares grew fewer and farther between as I distanced myself. Eventually, they went away altogether. But the darkness of that day, of that locked glance, it remained. As much as I tried, it could not be quelled or shaken. It ate away at a deep part of me, a hidden part, much like cancer. It still does, even to this day. Every now and again, like today, I return home. Mother passed long ago, as did my sister. I expect that I will soon follow in their footsteps. I don't know what still draws me here. Perhaps by returning, I entertain the dark notions burning deeply within my psyche. I long to see her, standing at the edge of the driveway, once more. I think that in doing so, I could somehow rid myself of what has bound her to me for all these years. The fear. At least, so I think. It's been a part of me for so long, though. I probably wouldn't know what to do without its constant presence. Honestly, it has been my longest relationship. My oldest friend. Like so many other times down through the years, I creep past the deserted drive. I feel the familiar tension tiptoe across the back of my neck and down my spine. My vision smolders. Will today finally be the day? My ravaged psyche pleads. But, as always, my once childlike yet now deadened gaze surveys nothing more than a broken down house. The End